Devin could hardly contain his excitement. He hurried into the dining room, put the package on the table, and turned the chandelier on. Brilliant white light spilled over the room and illuminated his newest purchase. His hand shook as he untied the twine used to keep the brown paper on the box. As a rough cord fell to the tabletop, the wrapper sprang open. Devin pushed the rest of it down and removed the thin silver cardboard container. He sat down, inserted his thumbnail between the top of the box and the edge, then neatly severed the scotch tape that had kept the container sealed. From within, he pulled out the bill of sale and a piece of heavy weight paper. Each corner of the curious bit of parchment had been folded in to the center, where they met and were held in place with a thick circle of green wax. The image of a scarab could be seen clearly in the sealing wax. Devon broke the seal and opened the letter. Upon the paper were five sentences. The first was written in Egyptian hieroglyphs. The second looked to be Greek. The third was undeniably Latin, and the fourth Arabic, and the fifth was more than likely Hebrew and Devon could read absolutely none of it. You do, I trust, have access to the internet? The dealer had asked him. Devon did have access, of course, and he said as much. There is a warning here and a precaution to take, the dealer had said. You must translate and read it for yourself. It cannot be told. Do you understand? Yes, Devon had answered. I understand. I understand completely. It was only upon his agreement to research the warning that the man had sold the item to him. For what was in the box, though, Devon would have promised the strange little antique dealer anything he asked for. Devon set the paper down on the table, wiped his hands absently on his pants, and removed his newest piece. A beautiful dark wood case, museum glass, had been expertly fitted between the wooden framework and stood upon a slightly wider base of the same colored wood. Within the nearly one foot square case was the true prize, however. It was a diagram of three large beetles and a massive, long-legged spider Devon had never seen before. The taxidermist who had built the piece had been a master at his art. Each beetle was arranged artfully upon a trio of branches and dried grass glued to the wooden base. Dirt had been attached to the bottom as well, and several large pieces of dried fungal growth had been secured to the branches. The three beetles were of different sizes. The first, and located the highest in the display, was a deep purple, almost black color, no larger than a silver dollar. The second, frozen in the act of leaving one branch for another, was slightly larger with a dark green color that shimmered in the light. The last and by far the largest of the beetles stood in the center. It looked as though it were an Egyptian scarab, except it was a brilliant, powerful gold. Beneath the branches peeking out from the shadows was the spider, dark gray in color with exceptionally long legs the spider's eight eyes caught the light through the museum glass and glowed. The antique dealer in Milford had asked for a high price, nearly three hundred, but it had been worth it. Devon knew he had to have it as soon as he had set eyes upon it. For several minutes he sat at the table and stared at it, smiling softly to himself. Finally, with a happy sigh, he stood up, gathered the paper wrapping, and the cardboard box in his arms and brought them to the recycling bin. He dropped them in, whistling a bit a bram to himself, and went about preparing himself a cup of tea. As the water slowly came to a boil, he went to his phone, saw there was a message from his ex-wife, and ignored it. 
He knew his alimony was late. He could mail the check out the next morning. Devin kept an ear open for the kettle, and he went around the apartment, drew the shades, and expected the maid's work. She had done an excellent job, as always, but his taxidermy collection needed his close attention. Other maids had failed in that part to care for his pieces the way he would like. Janet was quite adept at her work, which was why he retained her services for so long. With his daily inspection finished, he returned to the kitchen as the water came to a boil. After a few moments, he had his mint tea prepared and he sat down at the table. Delicate tendrils of steam curled up from the surface of the liquid and Devon looked lovingly at the beetles. He had added many beautiful pieces to his collection over the years, but the display before him was absolutely stunning. He was enamored with the scarab and can see why the ancient Egyptian had worshipped it. The magnificent, almost regal way it perched upon the branch spoke volumes about the taxidermist. The man had taken a tremendous amount of care with the placement of the insect, and Devon honestly didn't believe he could tire of looking at it. Pleased with the newest piece, Devon sighed and drank his tea. When he was finished, he stifled a yawn, took the cup to the sink, and rinsed it before he set it down. He returned to the table, picked up the strange letter and the diagram, and then he carried them both with him into the study. He placed them on the display mantle above the fireplace, turned on the gas flames, and retreated to his leather armchair. He held up the letter to examine it. Should I? he asked himself, glancing over at the laptop. With a groan, Devon sighed to himself, out of the comfort of his chair and over to the computer. He continued to stand as he turned the laptop on. He brought up Google and found a translate site and typed in the Latin sentence. Cursed and bound, the translation read. Touch not the scarab, lest ye be touched. Life from your life, an evil awakened. Frowning, Devon straightened up. He looked at the Latin, made certain that he had typed it incorrectly and saw that he had. Curious little warning, Devon thought. He shut the laptop down and carried the letter back to the chair. He put the parchment on the worn leather of the arm, hesitated, then went back to the display. A curse, what absolute nonsense, he thought. A strong desire to feel the scarab on his skin. Licking his lips excitedly, Devon cautiously lift the top off the case. Unnameable perfume caressed his nostrils, and he smiled. Of course I can touch it, he thought, grinning. It's mine. Devon reached in, felt the smooth body of the scarab. The sensation was sensual, titillating, in any way he had ever experienced in an item in his collection. Devon chuckled happily, withdrew his hand, and replaced the top of the case. Whistling to himself, David returned to the armchair, sank into it, and settled back, making himself comfortable. For a moment he considered a celebratory brandy, but he was tired enough. Too early in the evening for liquor, and he would never make it to watch the newest episode of Sherlock on PBS. A glance at the clock on his desk showed it was almost six. A short nap. Devon thought, yawning again, and then a light dinner. I can have my brandy later, as I watch Holmes and Watson. He closed his eyes, settled into the armchair, and slipped his shoes off, then wiggled his toes through his socks into the thick carpet. He smiled as he thought of his newest purchase. The flames made their curious soft popping sound. From the kitchen, the hum of the refrigerator could be heard. Somewhere out in the parking lot of this building, a car started, the engine loud. All of the familiar noises served a lullaby, and Devon easily drifted off to sleep. A sharp crack sound snapped Devon back to consciousness. He straightened up in his chair, accidentally knocking the letter on the floor, rubbed his eyes, and looked around the room. According to the clock, 
It was a little after nine, and the darkness beyond the study solitary window confirmed it. The room was lit solely by the light of the fire. Devin reached out for the floor lamp, found the pull string, and tugged it. He winched at the suddenness of the bulb's light, and it took him a moment to see clearly. Everything in the room was in sharp focus, and he quickly saw what had made the crack. The front of the pane of glass on his beetle diagram had broken. The upper right corner of it lay on the carpet. It glinted in the light of the floor lamp, and Devin wondered how a roughly triangular piece had fallen out, let alone break. He stood up, walked over to the glass, and picked it up. It was curiously warm in his hands. He put the segment on the mantle beside the diorama and smelled the sweet, delicate aroma. He looked at the beetles. Devin straightened up. Where is it? he asked, staring at the display. Where is it? The scarab was missing, gone, vanished from the branch. Devin twisted around and looked at the other segments in the study. Birds and small rodents, the upper portion of the black bear. How the hell could a scarab have disappeared, he thought. He shook his head and forced himself to breathe deeply. With an effort, he brought his racing mind under control and carefully began searching the room. He didn't worry about any rational explanation as to why the glass might have broken or how the long dead beetle could have gotten out. Devon focused on the important thing, finding it. He could always have the glass repaired, but it would be at moat point if he couldn't find the beetle. He looked down at the floor in front of the fire. If the glass was there, the scarab could be close by, he thought. Devon got down on his hands and knees. He crawled carefully, wary of any small shards of glass, while he peered around for the beetle. After several minutes of searching, he caught sight of it. The scarab was clinging to the underside of Devon's chair. One of the insect's forelegs moved slowly, greatly pulling at the strands of the black fabric beneath the seat. Without getting to his feet, Devon moved forward, keeping an eye locked on the escapee. He reached out, gently took a hold of the scarab, carefully pulled it out from underneath the chair. The insect scuttled around on the inside of his hand its legs disgustingly warm. How? Devon started to say, but then he stopped. Something brushed past his neck, and he felt a sudden sharp pain. Before he could swear, his arms and legs went stiff. He lost his balance, and he toppled over onto his left side. By the time he struck the floor, he couldn't feel anything. His thoughts were muddy, and the effort to think was painful. From where he lay on his side, he could still see the scarab. He watched it as it turned around and seemed to focus its attention on him. Then from the corner of his eye, Devon saw a sharp move. Dark, gray, long legs. Quick, alien movements, the spider from the diorama. It appeared from a shadow, carrying with it a large, pale sack made of finely woven silk, and even though the curious haze in his mind, Devon realized two things. First, it was the spider that had bitten him. Second, the spider was not an it, but rather a she. The scarab climbed down from the chair and joined the spider, taking the sack from her back. The two creatures stood beside each other, and a moment later, Two other beetles from the diagram appeared. They took up positions on the egg sack, and the three beetles rolled it towards Devon. The spider danced forward, picking her way delicately towards him with all her grace of an insane ballerina. Part of him desperately wanted to pull away to get as far away from the spider, but he couldn't. Her venom had stilled his muscles and when she reached him, she stretched out a foreleg gracefully. The sharp hairs on it caressed his cheek, and then he neither flinched nor screamed. She darted forward. 
The beetles continued to roll the delicate sack towards him while the female spider wove a web. She lay the anchor strand under his chin, and soon she raced back and forth across his face. Inwardly, he screamed, furious and terrified at the same time. He tried to pull away. Thin, powerful lines of the silk were laying across his eyes. The lids opened. The beetles disappeared from his line of sight, and when he felt them, legs working together up his neck and onto his cheek, they pushed the egg sack over before them. With great care, they pried open his mouth and tucked the egg sack between his gums. As the beetles backed away, the spider rushed across his face. She pulled his lips closed and sealed them shut with silk. From where he lay on the floor, Devon could see the letter that the antique dealer had pressed upon him. He could see the light glow of the dark green wax seal and fragments of the various languages written in powerful broad strokes. What did the rest of the language say, he thought desperately. Then against the sensitive skin of his mouth, Devon felt the smooth surface of the egg sac and numbly wondered when the spiders would hatch. The Girl in the Mirror The Girl in the Mirror is a scary story about a young boy who spends his days sad and lonely until he meets a strange little girl who only appears in the mirror. When I was a child, I spent a lot of time alone. My parents lived in an old house way out in the countryside, and there were no other children my age around. I had a little brother, but he was only a baby at the time so I couldn't play with him. I was always a little lonely. The countryside house where we had lived had a lot of small rooms. In the corridor, there was a closet with a sliding door where my father would store his tools. I'd love to go in there and play with the tools. It was fun for me at the time. One day I found an old mirror at the back of the closet. It was an oval shape and bronze framed, very ornate. Even though it was quite old and dusty, the glass was very clear and I could see myself perfectly. One day when I was playing in the closet, I happened to glance at the mirror and saw something that shocked me. In the reflection, I saw a strange girl standing behind me. Frightened, I turned around quickly, but there was nobody there. When I looked back into the mirror, I was confused. The little girl was still there. I guess because I was a child, I wasn't scared of her. I just thought it was strange that she only appeared in the mirror. The little girl had long dark hair and pale white skin. Through the mirror, she looked at me and laughed. Hello, she said with a smile. We started talking to each other, and the girl told me to call her Nana. We would talk all the time. My parents must have wondered why I spent so much time in that closet talking to myself, but they never took the mirror away from me. It seemed that Nana was not visible to adults. One day, I was talking to Nana. I said, I'm lonely. I wish I had some friends I could play with. Come over here and play with me. Nana said. I can go over there? I asked. How do I do that? Nana's face became troubled. Then she lowered her voice. I don't know, she whispered. I'll go ask. I wondered who she was going to ask, but all I could hear was silence. Somehow I felt like whoever it was, they didn't want me to listen. The next day when I spoke to Nana, she said happily, I know how you can come over here now. Come on, let's play. I was happy, but I remembered my parents had always warned me that I had to tell them before I went anywhere. Okay, but I have to ask my parents, I replied. Nana's face became a little troubled again, and she said, don't tell anyone about this. We may not be able to meet each other if you tell someone. I stayed silent because I didn't want to disobey my parents. Then Nana said, So you'll come and play with me? Tomorrow? Okay? Do you promise? 
Yes, I replied reluctantly. I promise. Nana reached out and touched the surface of the mirror with her little finger. Pinky swear, she asked with a smile. I reached out and touched the tip of my little finger to the mirror beside hers. Pinky swear, I said. I thought I could feel a slight warmth through the glass. That night, I didn't sleep very much. I didn't tell my parents about Nana. But as I lay there in the darkness, questions were swirling around me in my head. How could I enter into the mirror? What kind of place was it over there? Why wouldn't Nana come over here? If I went over there, how could I come back here? As I contemplated such things, I grew more and more anxious, and I became a little scared of Nana. The next day, I didn't go see Nana. I avoided her the day after that and the day after that. I didn't go near that closet at all during the week. In fact, I never went into that closet again. The weeks and months passed quickly, and I grew older. The months and years passed, and I grew up. I'd left home to go to boarding school in town. After I graduated, I'd started working in a nearby town. I didn't go home very much. Eventually, I met a girl, and we got married. By that time, I had forgotten all about Nana. Shortly after we got married, my wife found out she was pregnant. She went to visit her parents for a while. I was all alone in the house, so sometimes I would visit my own parents for dinner. They still lived in the same old house. One night, I decided to stay over and slept in my old bedroom. In the middle of the night, I woke up and went to use the bathroom. While I was washing my hands, I happened to glance in the mirror. A sliding door in the middle of the corridor was open. It was the closet where I had played as a child. I thought the door had been closed when I went to the bathroom. I turned around and was shocked to see that the door was closed after that. However, when I looked back at the mirror, the door was open. The chill went down my spine and my hands began to shake. I thought I saw the door sliding back slightly in the darkness. At that moment, I remembered Nana. I was overcome by fear, but it was impossible to tear my eyes away from the mirror. The door was moving, after all, in the mirror's reflection. A white mist was floating across the darkness at the back of the closet. As I stared, it formed into a familiar face, the smiling face of Nana. I think I must have fainted. The next thing I remembered, I was waking up on the floor. It was morning and my parents were still in bed. It must have been a dream, I told myself. Just a creepy dream. I wasn't comfortable staying in my parents' house, so after breakfast, I went back to my own home. My apartment has an underground parking lot, so I pulled into my reserved space and parked the car. Just as I was about to get out, I glanced in the rearview mirror and did a double take. There, in the mirror, was the face of Nana. I looked back in surprise, but there was no one in the back seat. I looked back in the rearview mirror, and Nana was still there. She was staring at me over my shoulder, and our eyes met. She looked exactly the same. The long, dark hair, the pale, white skin. And all that time, nothing had changed. She hadn't aged a day. I was trembling and I couldn't even take my eyes off her. Eventually, Nana laughed. Hello, she said with a smile. I felt like I was going to be sick. Why didn't you come back all that time, she asked. All this time, I've been waiting for you. I was silent. I didn't know what to say. I couldn't find the words. Hey, she said. Come over here and let's play for now on. In the reflection, her hand slowly stretched towards me. Let's play here forever, she said. It's no good, I screamed. I didn't mean to say it out loud. Nana, I'm sorry, I can't go over there. I won't go. Nana was silent and her hand stopped in midair. Trembling, I grasped the door handle and with all my strength, I spoke in a small voice like the little boy I had been a long time ago. I have a wife now. 
we're having a baby soon, so I can't. I ended up at a loss for words, with my head in my hands. I was shaking and shivering uncontrollable, and eventually I looked up at the mirror. Nana was still there. I see, she said. You became an adult, and you don't want to play with me anymore. Her voice sounded so sad and lonely. I can't, I said. Nana Chan laughed and smiled. It seemed like such an innocent smile. At that moment, I really thought Nana would forgive me for breaking our promise. Nana, I began, but she cut me off. If you won't play with me, I'll just have to find someone else, she said. Someone just like you. And then, suddenly, she was gone. Before I could fully understand her last words, she was gone. Once and for all, Nana never appeared to me again. That night, my wife had called me to tell me she had suffered a miscarriage. Our baby was dead. Then, I finally understood what Nana meant when she said, Someone just like you. Medical Examiner Talks to the Dead When the corpses arrive for an autopsy, they arrive with the clothes on in which they died in, and it's the expert's job to undress them to start the autopsy. Many times the deceased arrive with the facial expressions they had at their last moments. Fear, tranquility, anger, sadness, sometimes even with tears. Medical examiners give us a scientific explanation as required by their work but through personal experiences, they have had to combine science with their beliefs. Such is a case during an investigation, it was possible to find a grave of a professor who had been kidnapped, murdered, and buried weeks ago in a distant place. When he was exhumed, he was still in his uniform and was in a fetal position, and his face reflected a deep sadness. The work of undressing him without cutting his clothes, the clothes must stay intact and preserved for analysis, was practically impossible for the experts, given cadaverous rigidity. It was when the coroner arrived and said, I'm going to tell you what is the right way to do this. Everyone thought he was going to give us a technical, scientific, medical, or professional solution. But oh, surprise! He began to speak to the corpse, as he began to undress him. You're here, friend, he said. Your family already found you. You will no longer be there alone. The only thing they want is to watch over you so that you can be at peace. Look, they never stop looking for you. Help me so we can finish quickly so that you can go and be with your family. Then we saw that the corpse that had been buried for weeks began to loosen. Undressing it was very easy, and we were able to leave it in a position as if it was laying on its back. Its face had changed too. It looked calm. This tip is used by some caring doctors who, despite living with death on a daily basis, have not lost the sensitivity of knowing that before them it was a person who was a father, a son, a husband, and that they must be treated with respect and dignity.